other ways to diversify other revenue streams, uh, nucleus sales, queen sales, other hive products, that'd be wax, candles, pollen, mm -hmm. propolis, all that stuff. Um, the income potential from those is good, probably not as good as you know retail honey sales are. Mm -hmm. The you can make really good margins on candles and things like that. Yeah, can, yeah. Um, but especially on nuke sales, that's if you can buy sugar, you can make nukes. Absolutely, we build so, a lot of bees artificially. Yeah, so I it's, know that sounds appalling, but if you use the right product and do it in the right way, it's really not hard for the bees. It yeah, doesn't it doesn't contaminate anything? They stay healthy. So, you know, if you do use debt, especially, you have to have a certain amount of cash flow every year in order to service that debt. So, yeah. if you can keep your debt load to less than your nukes plus what you have to live on. Yeah then that's a way to you know focus on honey as a bonus yeah. and um, still be sustainable. So it's a good diversification. That's something I plan to get into. You but. can. You know, uh, back to pollination, 20 years ago, pollination was something that helped a beekeeper produce honey. In other words, it was his extra income that kept him in business if he, in order to keep him healthy to make honey. Now, in many cases, it's the opposite. Honey is just a little extra bonus that might help keep yeah. you in business so you can pollinate. That's because almonds are everywhere and in everything, it seems like. Yeah, well, you know, the almond industry is taking a little bit of a hit right now. That drought in California put a hurting on them. There, uh, my understanding, I don't go there anymore, so I'm just hearing rumors. There's less trees now than there was last year. They've taken some out. And um, once that happens, you know, <laughs> It, the, the growers gives them pause before they want to plant more almond trees. Look what happened to me five years ago. Yeah. And they're putting in other crops that are less uh, thirsty, need less water. And the price has come down in many cases. Some uh, beekeepers are reporting being offered prices 20 or $25 lower than they were being offered last year. Hmm. Some are not. Some say they're getting the same price, but some are saying they're having to take a lower price in order to get the same contract that they had last year. Hmm. And trucking's up. Yeah, of so, course. So, I mean, I know, I can think of two or three big beekeepers down in Florida that made the choice not to go to California this year after have gone, having gone to California for the last 10 years. They're just saying it's not as worth it anymore. We'll just stay home and make some honey instead. So, honey packing is another diversification. It is, yeah. Um, of course, I... I've used this quote before, but John Rockefeller looked at the oil industry and he said, I've got people drilling wells over here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this was before electricity. So there's houses burning down over here because the refining was terrible. So he put himself right in the middle. He's buying mm -hmm. oil from the producers that are taking on the production risk. And he's selling a refined standard product to uh, the end users and you've kind of done the same thing with honey yeah you're you're able to even out your bad years by buying more from other beekeepers and yeah. keep your shelf space at walmart and kroger and, and all them well you know a bad year is what got me into honey packing yeah. i had a bad year and i didn't want to lose my customer base so went and bought honey from a friend in south georgia all that my three-quarter ton pickup would hold <laughs> And I got it home and packed it, and it got sold, and everybody was happy. And I was getting calls from other people that I'd never heard of before saying, we hear you have some cases of honey for sale. It's all these mom-and-pop produce stands and markets. And uh, I had a light bulb moment. I thought, okay, I had a bad year. That means everybody around me had a bad year, too. And their customers are calling me to see if they can get cases of honey. So I went back to South Georgia, got six more drums, and... You know, I did it like five or six times that first year, and that that's how we took off into the packing part. Is that how you get started in it? Of course, you've got to meet your legal requirements. There's traceability yeah. that you have to meet and, well, and all that. Well, all honestly, at the lower level, if you're not in the bigger companies, the traceability is not as big an issue. We, we like to say we can tell you who fed the chicken, which chicken laid the egg, and who delivered the egg to the market, and what customer bought it, and who fried it. That's what our books can tell you when it comes to our honey. And uh, But when you sell to the little mom and pop uh, market here in town, they're not going to ask you for that. So that's another you know, reason maybe to not get too big, because suddenly you have to 
do all that stuff. Yeah. So getting started in that, if you want to well, bring in, you know, you've got a bad year, you want to bring in some honey, mm -hmm. you just need to know beekeepers? Yeah, I like to tell our customers, and it's the truth, I buy from beekeepers, that I, friends of mine that I know and trust. And uh, I've had an issue or two, and it only takes one, once burned, I'm done. You know, if yeah. I get, somebody screws me, I'll never buy from them again. It's interesting how, I, a little story, two years ago, I had a man in South Georgia who's a friend of mine, queen producer, I thought we were friends, sent me two bears as samples for two loads of honey, 130 drums of honey. I said, it looks good. I called him back, said, I'll take both loads. Well, they came right away. There wasn't a single drum on either one of those loads that resembled the bears that he sent me as a sample. It was thin, in danger of fermenting, it was dark, had a lot of Thai Thai honey in it, which is not considered table grade honey. Well, that'll never happen again. Yeah. And he sent me a letter the next year, or email actually, asking me, are you ready for some more honey? And I just politely told him I, I've gotten all I need for this year. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to get confrontational and tell him what he did, how he burned me but he did he burned me yeah so you, you as a punny packer you run into that kind of stuff you have to be aware of you know what could happen to you and that actually has to be built into your profit margin you have to be aware that some things are going to go wrong i have dumped done honey down the drain before yeah you know and uh might not be the last time i'm getting better when these honeys come in we don't trust that the whole load is the sample that was sent Louis, our warehouse guy, he'll spot check every third or fourth or whatever drum. Uh, he'll check it, moisture, whatever. And uh, we're, we're, we're getting smarter about it. And I just stick with the guys that treat me right, and I treat them right, and we have a good relationship. And, you know, the peop most of the people that sell to me sell everything they make to me, and they wouldn't sell to anybody else because we become very friendly, very trustworthy. I do what I say. And if in the rare instance they can't, we're talking about payments and stuff, I'm going to be seven days late, you know, that, just give me, you know, I call them and I talk to them. I just don't let it ride until they're calling me saying, where's my money? Yeah. And people appreciate that and vice versa. You know, I have a man down in Florida two years ago. He called me up, says, Bob, uh, you know, you're, you're getting four loads of honey. I got to tell you, you know, these 30 drums right here are, are high moisture. Yeah. Uh, you know, can we work this out? And I said, I'll take them. I just need to know which ones they are, paint a big red X on them, and we will blend them with thicker honey immediately so it doesn't ferment, and I can absorb that. Well, all it took on his part was a little honesty. I didn't need to find that stuff sitting in my warehouse with honey running on the floor yeah. in December because the lids were blowing off the drums. So I have this relationship with uh, the producers, and it works. It's, it's interesting, but um, Kent Williams told me at Hive Life, it, I'm amazed by the flavors of honey, how different yeah. they can be. It's just amazing. Yeah. But he said that smart weed honey is so bad that there is no dilution big enough. <laughs> no, that he's right. He said that it will ruin anything you put it in. One of these, one of these jars <laughs> is a sample of smart weed. And I'm like, why would you eat... Why would you even extract this stuff? It's terrible. <laughs> you, you put any amount of smart weed honey into a, a big, you know, one of your 10 yeah, drum yeah. tanks in here, and it's yeah. going to ruin the whole tank. Well, we experience the same thing here with rhododendron and mountain laurel. Yeah. If you got 10% rhododendron honey in there, it's not table grade honey anymore. I mean, it's not good at all. Yeah. So that's that's just here. interesting. Hive and the Honey Bee is a great book. It is. The the business parts of that book are depressing to read. Yeah, if you they, read that book cover to cover, you're you got to be pretty passionate to get through that. Yeah, you you really do, but the the business parts of it, uh beekeeping as a business were mm -hmm. written at a time yeah when the industry was not that good. Beekeeping for honey production in the United States is not profitable. The unit price received by beekeepers for bulk extracted honey has not changed in the last 25 years while the cost of production has increased. Thus, beekeepers who rely on honey production for income must supplement their income from other sources such as crop pollination and outside employment. This is going back to hive counts. And again, this is pretty depressing. And I want to talk about the timing of this. 
in the in the past, the traditional line between part-time and full-time beekeepers for statistical purposes was usually 500 colonies. An informed guess by us concerning how many colonies might support one family on a full-time basis is four times that number, or 2,000 colonies. I guess it depends on the family. <laughs> it's the size of the family. Yeah, and are your kids in there working and all of that stuff. I mean, I did my family. You know, I raised three kids on 500 colonies for about 10 years there before we started to really super expand. So, and Greg, he's, I think he's got two daughters or something. His wife works too, but still, um, I don't think you need 2,000 colonies to support well, a family. I want to talk about the, the timing because the I looked in here, it's written by two uh, professor emeritus's I don't know what the plural of emeritus is, but whatever it is, that's, that's what they are. One was from uh, Michigan State, the other one was from Florida, and they were entomology professors. Mm -hmm. And the most recent reference that they had at the end of this chapter was 2007. The next most recent was 1990, and most of their references were from 1933 through the 80s. Well, so I'm thinking maybe this material and this outlook is dated from that historical perspective. Yeah, well, that's also the wave we talk about, the ups and the downs. When I was working for Glenn and we were going to North Dakota, there was this government program where you could, um, you could, what was, what was, I forget the name of the program. You could put your honey in a warehouse and the government would loan you money, pay for your honey as a loan. And if you didn't pay the loan back, the government took the honey. That all happened with everybody knowing that the government was going to get the honey. And that's where that honey and part of the honey and cheese giveaway back at that time came from. And I'm trying to remember the numbers. I think the going price for honey was in the 30, 40 cent range. And the government price went up and down between 65 and 85. Wow. And if it wasn't for the government at that time, many large commercial beekeepers that were just doing bulk into drums would have been losing a tremendous amount of money, and the government kept them going. It seems like these days the appetite, especially for local honey, yeah. that has a transparent production history on it. Like, you go to the shelf, go to the grocery store, you see this honey on the shelf, you can tell where it came from, who made it, how it was made. Uh, if you can yeah. get that transparency on it, it seems like the demand on that is really increasing and is already very strong. Well, it's not just honey. It's everything, literally. Eggs, local eggs, farm-raised eggs, uh, honey, uh, local milk. I mean, you could just go right on down the line, and uh, honey is just part of the big picture. The landscape has definitely changed. The consumer is wiser, smarter, and uh, that, that's part of what's changing the local landscape for honey sales. Um, some of it is also foreign dumping is receiving more yeah, attention. Yeah, foreign dumping is uh, it's still going on. Oh, yeah. Of course, there's China and other countries you know how to circumvent and get around the, the tariffs for, and all of that. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, it's funny honey. Other countries are making mm -hmm. funny honey out of rice syrup or whatever. Yeah. Some of them are even adding real pollen to it so that they can yeah. pass a DNA analysis. Yeah. And then they're selling it on the market and subverting the honey industry in the U.S. It's, it's criminal. Yeah. Um, there's also another way of doing uh, illegal things that you can get away with, and that is mislabeling honey that you've purchased overseas. I know of an operation in Tennessee that is selling honey local, uh, selling honey labeled as local, and we know that the honey's coming from Vietnam. Wow. which may be actually originating in China, because I would be suspicious that Vietnam, Vietnam is one of those places that Chinese honey is going through. Every, he's being sued in court by other beekeepers, last I heard. I don't know how the case is going, but some beekeepers have just had enough. He's undercutting everybody. The honey is crystal clear. You can look right through it and read a newspaper. <laughs> so it's been filtered to the point where you can't tell what it is or isn't. You know, it's just, it's been, it's, it's definitely funny honey. That's what he's using it. You want sourwood honey? I've got sourwood honey. You want some black locust? I got black locust. <laughs> clover? Yeah, we got a clover label. Interesting that it all looks and tastes the same. Yeah. 
So the future of beekeeping, um, the business of beekeeping? I think it looks bright. I honestly do. I'm optimistic. You know, Seth, the young fellow that's working for me, we've talked about it a lot. I think there's a future for people that are willing to put in the work. I really do. There may even be a more opportunity now than there was 10 years ago because less people want to do it. I mean, so many people just want to work from home. I'm, this isn't a criticism or judgment, so let's get that crystal clear. I'm not criticizing people who want to sit behind a computer and work from their desk at home. But more and more people want to do that. More and more people are not willing to pick up the shovel handle. And people like us that are willing to do the work, I think there's more opportunity than there used to be, honestly. Well, Bob, I want to close with one more quote from R.O.B. Manley. Okay. Uh, again, I just love the way that he writes. It's beautiful. Yes, honey farming is a grand job for those who love bees and are interested in producing something from the land, who are hard workers and able to enjoy country life in all weathers. I've been at it for a long while, and my one regret is that I did not start with bee farming when I was 20 instead of going in for general agriculture and stock raising until I was 40. But every friend and relative I had was dead against it. It was regarded as mere idiocy to think of getting a living from beekeeping. So I wasted 20 years with bees as a sideline to which I could not devote my entire energies. I now know that if I had defied everyone and taken the bull by the horns, I should be, be, I should be much better off today than I am. However, I am not complaining. I have not done too badly as it is. I've thoroughly enjoyed the last 20 years during which I have depended entirely for my livelihood on one business only. Honey farming. That's a nice quote. I like that. That's a good way to finish, yeah.